Hello, everyone, and welcome to Inside Leather History, a fireside chat. I'm Doug O'Keefe, the host and producer of the chats, which are a program of the Leather Archives and Museum. Today, I'm sitting down with Lolita Wolf, a poly queer, kinky leather woman in New York City who is an author and an all around wonderful person to have on the chats. So, how are you, Lolita? I'm feeling good. A little nervous. <laughs> oh, we'll be gentle. Tell us uh, about your photo there. That's very unique. Your background uh, photo. It's an artist called Brassai. He's a French artist. And uh, this is from a collection of his Paris by Night. And I wanted to do a background and I thought I'd, I thought I'd bring a little humor into it. That's great. Okay. Yeah. And, you know, this is kink. In the old days, in the 1930s. Very valid point. Very yeah. valid. Let's start right at the very beginning on this. Would you tell us a little bit about where you're from, a little bit about your family? Well, I'm a native New Yorker. I'm a first generation American. My parents were German Jewish immigrants. Um, and I grew up in Queens. I always wanted to live in Manhattan. So now I live in Manhattan. Um, you know, I, I, it, it, it's, it's, that's my, that's, that's me growing up. What was so different about Manhattan versus Queens? Because it was the city, the city where, where everything was happening, Every, everything. Um, all kind of culture, whether it was museums or theater or nightclubs or everything, everything was in Manhattan. Um, now it's, I don't know, I went out last night. It was Saturday night in New York. I got out of the movie theater like before midnight and we couldn't find a place to eat on the Upper West Side after midnight, which was kind of like this COVID has really hit New York hard. Mm. So, um, yeah, it's a little bit frightening because I'm not used to that. Was it worth trying to go somewhere else in the city? Well, you know, I, y yes, we could have, you mm. know, but, you know, we're, 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 we do taxis and public transportation and, and we found a place. We found a place. Oh, it was, it was very fun. good. When you were young, you said you knew you were kinky. How did you know this? Well, there's two kinds of people in the world. There are people that discover kink, discover very early. They always knew they were kinky. And then there's people that find kink through a partner. Okay. I always knew I was kinky. Um, I remember being as young as first grade where I had fantasies of being the captured princess and I would, I would fantasize that I would have to do all these different kinds of things in order to stay alive. Uh. <laughs> um, so I knew I was kinky then. And it, there was, it was, it, it was, it went with me my whole life, but I never found other kinky people. And I didn't have any kinky role models. So it was uh, a little diff difficult to find. How about playing cowboy or Indian with the kids? Anything like that? Um, not so much. Um, what I what I wound up doing when I got a little older, I I played backgammon, um, and uh, a lot of times people would play backgammon for money, and I would play for a minute a point. Every point would be a minute, oh. and it would be. Um, I would start off with maybe back massages and then I would up the ante and get people to play with me for, uh, you know, 20 minutes of slavery. And for some people that was very edgy. <laughs> I didn't care who won. I just wanted to play the game. I, from the very beginning, I was always a switch. So I, I, it didn't matter to me if I won or lost. I just wanted to have that power play happening and I would do anything to get it. How did the other people react to this? Some people were like a little bit scared of that. 
Um, and some people, you know, went along with it. Most people went along with it. Anything that was very uh, shocking to you or to them? Nah. <laughs> no, not really that shocking. You How know? far were you able to get with any of it? Sexual acts. Okay. You know, I mean, I, I it would, it, a lot of times it just started with doing dishes and it would progress to different sexual acts. But, you know, I was having sex anyway without the power imbalance. I love power imbalance. I think it's really hot. Tell us more about that for someone who may be viewing this video. What does that mean to you? <sighs> um, it's like, who's in charge? Who's, who's the boss? Who's the master? Who's the slave? Who's taking the orders? Um, I, and, and I, I do love that. You know, unfortunately right now, I'm, I'm my primary relationship with somebody where we're very balanced, mm -hmm. <laughs> but, um, you know, I've had, I've had different, um, master slave type relationships. And I think that they're really, really hot. Um, they can be. Now, where do you fall on that scale? Oh, I'm either one or the other. Okay. I, like I said, I've always been a switch. I've always been somebody that I just want to play the game. And, um, when I, when I say I'm in a balanced power relationship right now, it's that sometimes I'm in charge. Usually I'm in charge, but sometimes I'm not. And that, that kind of works out for me. How have your, uh, various, partners in this how have they navigated that with you navigated the fact that i switch i mean some people have a problem i i i've had relationships where people have said you can't be a real dominant if you switch mm. and i'm like you know fine we'll just blindfold you while i do this <laughs> Um, you know, it's it, some people have issues around it and some people just, you know, you, the thing that you want to always do is you want to surround yourself with the people that like you the way you are and not with people that are going to put you down and, and not accept you for what you are. Yeah. That's, that's really, the, that's a major takeaway right there. Absolutely. Yeah. I agree. You have to be true to yourself. I, and I, I know people that have not been true to themselves. I'm not going to mention names, but, you know, people that have gotten themselves into relationships where they're the master and they miss bottoming. And, you know, I'm somebody that would, I'll, I'll teach a slave how to top me, wow. <laughs> you know, wow. and, you know, and I'll just say, now spank me, <laughs> you know, that, that works for me. And, you know, I'm very particular. I've, you know, I, I think the older I get, the more particular I am, you know? Um, so I'll train people how to top me. Wow. That, that's a fascinating concept, but clearly it's something that works well for you. So yeah, I don't think, I don't think I'm the only person that does that. Tell me more about that, though. I mean, if somebody who would find themselves in that kind of a situation, what, what would you like to say to them? You have to ask for what you want. And sometimes you have to make it happen. Yeah. That, that's other important things to take away from this. You came out into New York City and you experienced New York City at a very dynamic and wonderful time. A lot of nightlife, a lot of kink nightlife. Tell us about the New York City of legends that you came to know. Well, there's a lot of legends that I don't know, okay? Because I came out after some of that, you know. Um, 
but I came out around the time where there was um, the vault and there was paddles. And those were the two main BDSM clubs. There were also um, some of the, some of the pro dom houses <coughs> that would have evenings like the loft would have uh, BDSM nights and um, later on diff different, different, uh, different pro dom houses would have parties. Um, and, and they still do. Um, you know, there were many parties, Loy Cachet, Arena Blaze, you know, a lot of the old pro dom houses would open their doors and, you know, rubber studio, um, you know, nowadays, um, they still do sometimes. And sometimes even the swingers clubs would open up for BDSM nights. Um, when I first started coming out, it, it was, there were less rules, but there were still rules. Um, and, uh, I mean, it was a little bit scary. It was, it was, it was definitely seedy. Um, you know, the vault was known as a S and M and J O club. Okay, back back then, of course, you know, BDSM was only a term that came out in about 1994 um, on the internet, um, and so usually it was called either DS or it was called SM. Yeah. Um, and when you say SM and JO, the JO was jerk off. Yeah. So uh, we would be doing scenes, and there would be all these guys standing there jerking off, and that was just part of the way it was. Um, whereas at paddles, there was less jerking off, uh, paddles in those days had a liquor license. Oh yeah. It, 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 it was a little bit different. It was not, uh, I think it, I don't think it was as edgy as the vault. You mentioned men being there. These were pansexual places. Yeah. All sorts of people would go there. Um, there were nights that were men only. Okay. There were other nights where just everybody, it was a whole mix of people. You'd find a lot of um, trans people. In those days, they were called transvestites and cross dressers. Um, and uh, you'd, you'd see all kinds of people, uh, like every every kind of person and you know yeah tell us how you even located these places they would not have been easy. no <laughs> um i came out online and this is online when online meant the phone lines okay okay um i first started calling sex lines uh, just regular mainstream sex lines. I, I don't know what I was looking for. And one night somebody said, oh, let me three-way you onto this other line. It's a real hoot. And what I heard was, welcome to the dungeon where all your fantasies can come true. Blah, you know, they have the whole introduction and it's going to cost you this much per minute, blah, 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 blah. And I was like, really <laughs> oh. and we we got dumped on there were like party lines where lots of people would chat and i heard all these people talking about sm and you know bondage and all of these things and i was like oh my god this is this and up to then i did not think that these were proper people for me to be hanging out with. Uh -huh. um, but I, I it, you know, I quickly got off the phone with this person that three-wayed me on and I started calling on my own. And a lot of it was listening. And I was listening and I found people had really good senses of humor. They were smart. They had a lot of other things going on in their lives. And I was just like, oh, because before then... The only time I ever heard about SM was 
when something bad happened, Mm -hmm. you know, the big, the big thing that was, that really chilled me was um, the, there was an art dealer named Crispo and um, there was some kind of threesome. It was three men and the bottom died, you know, and the New York post, of course, you know, so, so sensational. And they're like, and here's the leather hood and here's the handcuffs. And I'm like, this is what I really want. <laughs> but uh, uh. I also didn't want to die. And I was like, oh, if you play with these kind of things, you could die. And because I didn't, I didn't have any role models. I didn't know people that did this safely. I, I, I just, I, I there was, I didn't have the access to that. I didn't see it anywhere. I didn't know how to look for it. You know, this was before the internet and the phone got me in touch with people. And from there, I started going out to the clubs. Um, you know, and it, it, it's kind of funny because years earlier, I wanted to go to Plato's retreat and um, my, my date at the time um did not want to go you know it chickened out okay you know and years before that i went out on a date and we went to the vault and the guy there was like he discouraged us from going in you know well we weren't the i don't, I don't think we looked like we belonged there okay Why? you know why didn't you? I didn't look kinky. You know, I didn't have leather. I didn't have, you know, when I first started going, I wasn't wearing, uh, I didn't have fetish wear. I was, I was just showing up in little Betsy Johnson dresses. Um, <laughs> you know, I was, I was, you know, I was showing up in Norma Kamali. Um I, you know, I didn't know what I was doing. I didn't have anybody telling me. I didn't know where to buy the right clothes. Okay. (laughs) But one thing I can't help but ask in all of this is you were doing all of this initially via these phone lines, which charged exorbitant rates. You must have had a heck of a phone bill. Well, the the phone lines, um, they would let a certain amount of women on for free. Oh, so after I got known, you know, I, I did have a couple of big phone bills. I did, you know, but it was worth it. Okay. It was an investment for me. Um, and, um, and then they would let us on for free because, you know, guys that call into phone lines don't want to talk unless there's, you know, women there. Oh, all right. Yeah. And, you know, I, I went to the clubs. I, I would, I would go out with like um, my mainstream friends and then I'd go hit the clubs by myself and I would meet people and p- those people taught me, you know, cause I, I'd ask people, you know, th- I mean, that's how I first learned how to use a flogger and, you know, I, I just met people and, you know, and, you know, I was young and pretty and um, people would teach me stuff <laughs> and then I would meet stuff and people and I would go out and there you go. What were some of the favorite things you learned to do? Um, well, in the early days, um, I did, I, I it, it was a lot of flogging, a lot of flogging. I did a lot of flogging, um, spanking stuff like that. It was, I was, uh, you know, it it wasn't until later that I found other things, um, that, that, that I got interested in, you know, and I, um, you know, the bondage I did, I didn't get into rope till later either, you know? Um, so, you know, and I, I didn't get into, you know, later on, I got into needles and things like that. You know, I learned how to use a single tail later on, you know, so, um, 
pretty much my entry level was like flogging and spanking. That was like beginner stuff for me. Anything you really disliked? No. Okay. I mean, no, um, no. I mean, I, I, I don't do everything, but I don't dislike things. Okay, that's fair. I'm, I'm, to I'm not judgmental. You know, um, I got into age play very early too. Um, I was, I was doing some of that stuff down there. Um in the early nineties. Um, again, not really having people for um, role play uh, or, or not role play role models for that kind of play. I, I didn't see a lot of age play. There was some, but a lot of that, a lot of them were adult babies. And I, that wasn't really my thing. I was beyond diapers. Hey, very good. Yeah. Yeah, that, that is not a, a, at least from my estimation, that is not a very public uh, play activity unless I'm just not well versed on it. Um, it's, it's something, I mean, my first mommy was a gay leather man. Um, and it was something that was very, um, very edgy because it wasn't accepted. Fascinating. Why not? Have you met Gay Leatherman? <laughs> Touche. Okay. You know, I mean, you know, uh, yeah, no. <laughs> okay. Hey, you know, there's something out there. Lots of things I don't know. So. Right. But the Jugendspiegel Society, otherwise known as TESS, T-E-S. So um, can I correct you? Yes. Eulenspiegel. Eulenspiegel. Okay. I am appreciative. So the Eulenspiegel Society, otherwise known as TESS, yeah. that was very influential for you. And it, it taught you a lot about SM and your development in that. Tell us a little bit about that. What is it? What did it do for you? All that good stuff. Um, well, the first time I went there was a little bit of a disaster. Um, they were meeting in a swingers club. Not in a swingers club, a strip club. Okay. Um, down on Church Street, the Harmony Club. And I went there and I was one of the few women that were there. I was like, there was maybe one other woman there. Um, and it was, it was kind of a sleazy place mm. and the speaker didn't show up and brother Leo got up and talked about his history and he talked about this, his mistress, Roxanne and, um, how Roxanne tied him to a stool and started kicking the stool and he got very frightened and said, please, mistress, stop kicking the stool. I'm scared it's going to tip over. And she kept doing it. <laughs> and it tipped over and he broke his collarbone. Oh. That's That was my takeaway. And I was just kind of like, this is not the kind of SM I'm looking for. This is, this is not my scene. And I didn't go back for a long time. Oh, wow. um, and then I met Hilton Flax at the vault one night and he had an outreach table for the oil and Spiegel society. And we hit it off and we became friends and I started going back to Tess. at that point. They were in the same building that the harmony club was in, but they were like on the third floor in a big loft. Um, and it was brightly lit. It was clean. It was, um, it, and and I liked the programming a lot better. You know, my my issue was, you know, the whole brother Leo thing. It, it didn't have the consent element that was really important to me. Uh -huh. You know, I mean, that without that, that was the. You know, I mean, this was. 
you know, uh, before I heard the term safe, sane, consensual, which was before any of these other st stupid terms, um, <laughs> prick and rack and, you know, um, but, you know, I was, I was just like, yeah, I, I need things to be a little bit more consensual and safe. And, you know, that, you know, so it, it was better than a test. And, um, and then I wound up in 91 running for the board of tests. Um, and I was on the board for tests for about five and a half years. Oh. Um and we, we did a lot of really, really good stuff there. Um, one of the planks that I ran on, when I went to test, they had four prices. They had uh, male members, male non-members, female members, female non-members. And I wanted everybody to, I, I didn't like the gender pricing. Mm -hmm. And that's one of the things that I got changed because um, I didn't, I, you know, that, that, that bothered me. Why were they doing that? Um, I think a lot of places do that. Um, a lot of like swingers places do that because um, they're trying to get more women in the door. You know, women are a commodity. I see. I don't like that women would be a commodity fascinating you know and it's like if if women pay the same price as men you know i mean i've been i've been i've been to clubs where you know women pay five dollars and men pay thirty dollars or something wow and you know men then expect something you know, and it's like, no, I, 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 I don't believe in that. Fascinating. Now, how did you find the demographic? Was it pretty much a, a good balance or was it, how did it break down in that respect then? It was a better balance than it was when I first went. Okay. Yeah. Wonderful. I, I, uh, I have to plead a little ignorance. I didn't know any of that. That's fascinating. Now- well, That's why you're doing these videos. You have a point, haven't you? <laughs> but tell us how Oil and Spiegel, how does it benefit people going forward? How did it benefit you going forward as it grew? Um, but as, as I just, I learned a lot. Okay. Um, and, you know, Hilton was one of my mentors. Um, he taught me a lot of stuff. Um, Morgan taught me a lot of stuff. Morgan was, um, she was a dominant woman. She, she just passed away a few months ago. She was, um, she did a lot of the programming and she, um, she encouraged me to teach. So um, I, she's the one that got me going with teaching. Um, and that, that was a very influential thing for me. Um, I, uh, you know, I, 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 I didn't, you know, I just did little Tuesday night things. Um, in 1992, I went to living in leather in Chicago and that blew me away because um, really there weren't any, any big national events before living in leather, um, which I think started in 89 or something. Um, and I, I went in 92 and it was workshops all day and like people who really like topics that I never saw at home. There was dungeon play every night and there were things, you know, it was the first time I saw somebody hitting somebody with a single tail. And I just thought that was crazy. <laughs> now I, I hit people with single tails 
I teach uh -huh. single tails. I mean, it's, I guess it's not so crazy. Um, but you know, it was like, Oh my God. Um, I, you know, I just saw a lot of things. It was the first time I really saw, um, needles and that fascinated me. And I learned how to do that. I learned a lot of things and I brought a lot of stuff home okay. to, to test. Um, and that was very exciting. Um, and the whole concept of national event was very exciting to me too. I should think. Absolutely. Yeah. How did your local community react to some of these things you were bringing back and teaching? It was great. I wasn't the only one going. Okay. So it wasn't just me bringing, you know, I, it wasn't just me. Oh, okay. um, but um, it, it was, it, it was exciting. Um, people liked it. Um, you know, we, we, we got other New York was interesting because people always travel to New York. So we'd get a lot of people from out of town come and teach a test because they would be in town anyway. Okay. You know, we brought in people from GMSMA, the gay male SM activists. They would come and teach for us. You know, people from LSM, lesbian sex mafia would come and teach. Um, and both GMSMA and LSM were founded in, 81 test was founded in 71 and test okay. um, test was a lot more pansexual at that time. And then when GMSMA and LSM were formed, test became um, still pansexual, but, but less lesbian and less gay. Okay. okay. It became, I, I don't want to say straight because there was even a bisexual uh, special interest group at, at tests. So, um, it, you know, it, yeah. But when you started teaching, what did you most enjoy teaching? Well, um, I mean, I, I taught, I mean, the first thing I ever taught, uh, was a class on, um, bottoms and assessing bottoms, you know, um, finding people so it wasn't skill-based um and later on it it did become skill-based um like the earliest things that i taught were spanking <laughs> beating ass um and i i even went and you know uh gmsa would have two open meetings a year that were open to all genders i even taught at one of those meetings maybe more than one of those meetings. Um, and when we had the international leather celebration in 94, that was the first time I taught nationally. Oh. So that was, um, I, I taught spanking at that, at that, um, at that event. So, um, you know, now I could teach a lot of different things. You know, I, I, I teach, um, I teach polyamory classes. I, I do a whole thing on switching. I teach single tails. I teach needle play, wax play, um, just mummification, some rope bondage, just, <laughs> Yeah, it's a, a little bit of this and a little bit of that. That's wonderful. I, are you uh, invited to a lot of other places to do this? Um, more in the past, okay. um, but I, I do some teaching. I'm, I'm part of Midori's cadre for her rope dojo, um, okay. which hasn't happened since the pandemic. Um, I, uh, I, I teach at LSM usually once a year or so. Um, I teach at Dark Odyssey um, and I, I do their programming for one of their events called Fusion, usually okay. just Fusion. Um, although last year they didn't have Fusion, so I did the summer camp programming instead. So um, I like doing that. You know, I did programming at TESS and I learned a little bit about that. And then 
when I was chair of LSM, I did a lot of pro, you know, that's what the chair does is the programming. So I like, I like doing programming and I, I did programming for BR 10, which happened in 1997, um, which was their 10th anniversary event. And then I also did their programming for the classes in B at BR 98 black Rose in yeah. DC. Um, and, uh, and I, I used to help Tony, Tony de Blas, um, with some of the living in leather programming too, because, you know, he was very West coast oriented and he wanted some East coast input. And, um, and I just adored anything that Tony did. I, 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 I went to, I think I sat in on his CBT class, like a dozen times. I oh. could just like watch it over and over again. I mean, a, it's something I'm into, but B, I was totally into Tony. Um. <laughs> but the 25th anniversary of Stonewall was a very big deal for you. Tell us about that. Yeah, yeah, it was a big deal. Um, I mean, a lot of big deals. Um, I, I was part of the Leather Pride Night Committee. And um, the Leather Pride Night Committee put, it was... LSM, GMSA, GMSMA, TESS, the Excelsior's MC, um, NLA Metro, when they had a chapter here in the, in, in the city, Defenders, um, New York, which was the, um, the Catholic group, the Catholic leather group. Um, and we all would get together once a year to do a big fundraiser. And, um, and I was on that committee and um i was at that committee i really made um a connection with david weinbaum who was another one of my mentors um and who was actually my first leather mommy i mentioned him uh earlier but not by name anyway um and he I worked a lot with him and he taught me a lot about community and, and fundraising. Um, he was past president of GMSMA. Um, anyway. Um, so we did this event. We decided we, that it's the 25th anniversary of Stonewall. We're going to do the international leather SM fetish celebration um, and we got the Hyatt Hotel in New York by Grand Central Station. We had Friday and Saturday. We had 64 workshops. Wow. Um, and it was, oh, I, sh I should have brought over the, um, the, the program book reads like a who's who. Wow. Everybody was there. Like everybody. Think of a name. They were there. Mm -hmm. You know, whether it was Di Baldwin whether i mean it, it, david stein i mean it just like everybody that you could possibly imagine was there mm. uh, and and teaching um and uh and on sunday we did the march so um you know that was uh that was very exciting um it was a very big event big fundraiser we raised a lot of money for a lot of diff different um groups yeah what were your feelings though about that being the 25th anniversary of stonewall it was very exciting okay. was very, i mean you know it was very exciting i mean the biggest thing about this was bringing all of these different groups together to make something big like this happened there were 2500 people there and to get 2500 people together before people had the internet yeah okay so we printed thousands tens of thousands of flyers and i remember sending out flyers all over the country to every leather event and ever every leather bar and every leather group and there weren't that many you know, but there were phone trees that back then people would call each other on the phone and the mail was a big thing. <laughs> yeah, 
you know, um, and it, it wasn't till right around that time there were people saying, do you have email? <laughs> you know, they wow. weren't asking what's your email address. They were like, do you have email? You know, um, because people were starting to get online around then, but most people were not. Well, I, I have to say, I feel uh, almost a little jealous that I wasn't able to be there for such an amazing event because the way you've depicted it, it would have simply been incredible. It was, it was incredible. And the way everybody worked together, um, I remember they had the Steel Bondage Exploratorium um, because David Weinbaum had a big metal collection and Jack McGeorge had a big metal collection. And this woman, Becky from Baltimore, had a big metal collection. And the three of them put their collections together and made a whole exhibit. It was, it was incredible. Um, yeah. <laughs> um, we, yeah, the, the classes were incredible. Everything was just amazing. It was amazing getting all those people together. Now, what were your thoughts on how the people interacted? Was there a lot of drama? Was, was there a no. view or anything like that? I mean, the biggest drama was Talia and her whip. You know, there was a bunch of people that didn't want Tala to, Tala to, to have her whip at the parade because it wasn't a parade. It was a March. So some people were like, this is a March. It's supposed to be solemn. We're trying to, you know, I'm not going to mention names, but there were people that were like, we, we need to like calm it down. And then there were other people like we're SM people and we should be proud of that. And, and that it was a pride thing. So um, that was the big drama that, that you would see. And that was mainly on Sunday at the parade about like, you know, should Tala be there with her long whip? There always seems to be some controversy in any kind of parade in the community, whether or not the Kingsters should be part of it. What do you say to them? Well, um, <laughs> we bought our way in. You know, I mean, the, the way we got into the March on Washington, you know, we 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 raised a lot of money. Yeah. You know, that was like part of what At Leather Pride Night did was raise money for that so that we could get in. Um, we donated money so that Bruce Marcus could be up on stage at the at the end of the Stonewall march and give a speech um you know so sometimes you you buy yourselves in i mean leather pride night was started as a fundraiser for the christopher street march which is the predecessor to the gay pride march in in new york you know and and for many years it 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 gave money and then they didn't need as much money because they had corporate sponsors. So we just would give them a little bit of money just to have them on the, on the marquee. Um, but we were giving money to like anti-violence project and um, Hetrick Martin and just like other places that we felt needed our, our money. And, you know, um, we, we had a good relationship with like domestic violence project and they, you know, they wrote that we we uh, you know we talk and that there's not there might even be less domestic violence in our community than in the mainstream community because of the way that we are trained to talk and 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 negotiate. Wow, wow. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's fascinating. Mm -hmm. But when we prepared for this, you told me that you like breaking people's assumptions about things. Tell us about that. What does that mean? Um, well, there's a lot of people out there that believe that there's a, a right way to do things. And I do believe that there's many right ways to do things. Um, and it's kind of like what I was talking about, you know, 
uh, as a switch. You know, there's a lot of people that think you can't be a real whatever mm -hmm. if you're if 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 you can't make up your mind. Um, I think there's a lot less of that going on now. The youth of our community is a lot more open to being switches and playing with gender and etc. Why do you think that's the case? Because we showed them. We, we, we made it happen for them. Um, I think the internet has opened things up a lot more. Um, anyway, um, how do I, you know, I, I like a lot of people like, I, okay. So like I said, I was into age play, you know, uh, a lot of people expect a little girl to be submissive to their daddy. And, uh, no, <laughs> um, if you meet a real little girl that's six years old, they're in charge. They're going to, they're going to sit you down. They're going to tell you, you're going to do tea now, how you're going to take your tea, where you're going to sit, you know, everything. Um, so, I mean, the reality is little girls, are in charge, uh -huh. um, you know, and I'm, I'm lucky. I have a service daddy who's not in charge, who does what I want. <laughs> you know, I'm the princess. Um, <laughs> um, You're entitled. I am entitled. I could do whatever I want. That's the point. That's the big takeaway is ask for what you want and then set it up so you can have what you want. OK, um, you know, I uh, another another way, you know, like people would always like, you know, it's like, you know, I, I, I had a master slave relationship and, you know, I taught my slave how to spank me, like spank me now. <laughs> and pe that would just blow people's minds, you know, or I would <laughs> I love I remember. One time we were at um, Thunder in the Mountains and I, I tied him up in the dungeon and then I got on my knees and blew him. Wow. And people were like freaked out because it's like, you, don't, you just don't see the master blowing the slave. Wow. It's just not done. Yeah. And it's like, I do what I want to do. Wow. <laughs> so it's done. OK, and so I, I, I and I did it because I want to do it. But then I really got off on the fact that people were like, oh, look at that. That's like really crazy. Yeah. Um, <laughs> you can see where that would raise a few eyebrows. I certainly can. I do like raising some eyebrows. <laughs> Which is why you have so many wonderful things to share. So, yeah. but you mentioned a moment ago that the little girl's always in charge and you were the first international Little Miss Littles. Tell us about that. Um, okay, so that happened in 2010 in Chicago at Kinky College. Okay, I have had opportunities to run for titles in the past. And honestly... Uh, every time I saw that kind of opportunity, it I would open so many doors. It's like, no, I got my doors open. And actually, a lot of the, the things that you had to do as a title holder would have maybe held me back from a lot of stuff that I was doing. Wow. Uh, well, you know, I was asked in 93 to run for IMSL, the International Ms. Leather. Yes. Um, and, you know, I looked at the contract, you know, because they have a contract you have to sign. Yeah. And it was like, you have to do six fundraisers and half the money has to go back to IMSL. And the other half of the money has to go into your travel fund. And I'm like, I'm already doing all these, these fundraisers and shit. And it's like, I, but I want, I didn't, 
I didn't want the money going to my travel fund and back to IMSL. Okay. At, and I, I think it, this is first generation IMSL. This is before, you know, this is when it was still in San Francisco. I, it's different now. I don't know what it is now exactly. So, you know, th- it it's probably different. Yeah. Okay. Um, and I, ju- I just, I just didn't like it. And I, I was not a big fan of, of the title circuit as much. That's not to say, I mean, I did judge Imsel. I did judge Imsel boot black. I did judge IML. I've judged a bunch of titles. I, I, you know, I'll go to my local titles, you know, cause it's a fun night out, but I'm not a big, I, I didn't see myself as a title holder, but you know, there's all the fun part of being a title holder. And when this international little miss littles, I was like, well, I'm a little, this looks like a lot of fun. I want to sash. Uh-huh. And I, I, um, I entered, I had amazing judges. Um, I, I got myself a brand new party dress with lots of pink ruffles. And I, I had a, I had a, uh, Everybody had to have a skit, like a fantasy. Yeah. And I brought brought my bear. Oh, that's cute. And and I had uh, a friend of mine who was my dolly. And um and you know we did a tea party and she misbehaved. She kept picking her nose, so I had to spank her. Okay. And that was my talent. Um, and my my question was do I know my ABCs, which I stumbled on because, you know, I did the whole ABC. I got to L and I was like, L, 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 A, N, M. Oh. And then I was like, uh, L, M, N, N, C, S, F. You know, I, I, and I started oh, I playing with, with some of these letters and pe- there were like Rick Storer was, he was in charge of L A and M at the time, Leather Archives and Museum, and yep. he was in the audience. And he was he was on the floor. <laughs> um, Susan Wright was there, who had started National Coalition for Sexual Freedom, and she thought that was amazing too. So it's like I took this pop question and messed it up in a really good political way. Um, okay. I'm off track. Oh, anyway, I won and I got a sash and it had no responsibilities, but I had a sash and I went up on stage at mid Atlantic leather and at IMSL. And I went up on stage at, um, you know, Folsom street East, you know, every, everywhere I went where there were title holders, I got myself up on stage with them because why not? Exactly. (laughs) You know, and I just had a really fun time with it. Um, so it's 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 definitely the title for me. But let's take a step uh, aside, a step back for a moment, because when the AIDS pandemic hit in New York City, a lot of negotiation was required to keep the uh, SM clubs open. And you even mentioned that the separation of BDSM and sex in the community is partially your fault. Would you <laughs> okay, talk okay. about that, please? So basically, New York, New York's pretty good about sex. Okay. Um, the problem was during the AIDS pandemic, sex was the reason that people got AIDS, unprotected yeah. sex. And in the clubs, that was happening. Um, and in order to keep the clubs open, they had to convince the city, look, these sex clubs need to stay open because that way we can teach people, we can do outreach to people, people can um, do it safely, we have some control. So New York City came up with these safe sex guidelines. And the safe sex guidelines were that there was no penetration with a dick whether it was oral or any other hole. Um, And you could use hands 
and you could use toys as long as they were covered in latex. Um, you could, um, it, 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 they, there was, there was rules. Yeah. Um, and that's what kept the clubs open. And when Tess made their dungeon rules, they were first and foremost based on Tony de Blas's dungeon rules. Cause you know, Tony, Tony's the originator of everything. Eh, well, maybe not, but you know, um, but you know, it's, it's the whole that it starts with, do not touch anybody. Do not touch anybody's things. Do not interrupt the scene. You know, the, all of those basics, but then we added in all the New York safe sex laws. Okay. You know, there is no penetration with a dick. And there's, you know, no oral sex. There's, you know, you have to cover everything with a with latex, yada, yada, yada. And yeah. those became our rules. Well, as the internet started, people began to find each other in different places. Because really, when in the beginning of the 90s, you could list all the clubs, all the BDSM clubs on one sheet of paper. <laughs> And there would be the, the mixed clubs, the, the women only clubs, the men only clubs. And, you know, and that was the national list of clubs. Um, and so there wasn't a lot. Anyway, when the Internet hit, people found each other and they were like, we need to start a club. How are we going to start a club? So they would get to they would write to tests. And I, I was answering a lot of that mail, that email, you know. Can we have a copy of your bylaws? Yeah, here, here's cut and paste. Boom, there's the bylaws. Can yeah. we have a copy of your 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 dungeon party rules? Yeah, here you go. I didn't think about it. I didn't think about. I just sent it, and so all over the country, people were like having these rules that were, uh, kind of anti-sex in the dungeon. Even though there are cities might not have, you know, uh, demanded those kind of rules. You know, our, our rules were very New York City focused. Does that make sense? But in the end, do you think that these benefited the population on a bigger scale? I don't know. Okay, that's fair. I don't know. I don't know. I mean, um, you know, now I, I go places where we don't have those rules. I mean, where, you know, barriers are encouraged, you know, and I do have to say, you know, I, I want to plug New York city because during the pandemic, they came out with COVID safe sex laws, safe sex guidelines. And they, they mentioned glory holes as being safe sex. <laughs> I love New York. Okay. okay. So, I mean, they didn't say the word glory holes, but they said, if you had a wall between you, that would be really good. Uh, okay. You know, I uh, mean, it, it, and New York is amazing. Um, where I work there, there's free condom distribution and where I work, where if we are a distribution center for free condoms, where do anybody you work? Can, I work at purple passion, which is a fetish store in New York. But you received a Lifetime Achievement Award from the NLA. Tell us about that. You know, that was 1997. I think that was kind of early. Um, because, you know, 1997, I, 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 I was just getting started. Um, I've had a few other um, awards too. I've had a couple of Pantheon awards. Um, I mean, I don't know what to say about the award. That's okay. It was an honor nonetheless, yes? Yeah. Great. Yeah, yeah. What is your opinion about mentoring in the community? Okay, so first of all, I've had a bunch of mentors. Nobody ever came to me and said, I want to mentor you. It just was something that <sighs> developed and happened. I think a lot of people, um, there's a lot of abuse 
by people that want to be mentors. And, um, and I've seen people be mentors and hold that out as a cherry here. I'll mentor you and teach you. And then they wind up sometimes isolating people, teaching people things that that's not necessarily true. Um, and taking advantage of people, you know, it's like, you know, I, I have mentored people, um, but I've, it's, it's never started out as a mentoring relationships. It's been um, it's just something that developed and, and happened. Yeah. Um, I think some people have ulterior motives when it comes to mentoring, but I think mentoring is very important. Um, yeah. What advice do you have for people who are new to the community, newly exploring this? Well, you know, it's going to sound like a broken record. Ask for what you want. You know, you make it happen. Um, don't believe everything you read on the internet. Don't believe things that people, everything that people tell you, mm. um, you know, figure it out. You don't have to figure it out all at once. Um, I, I have a uh, newbie does not mean young. I've met new people that are in their forties and I've met young people in their twenties that have been doing this for 10 years. Yeah. Um, so I, 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 I don't like the ageism that happens with, with the young people. Um, you know, and I, you know, I've, I've just seen, I've seen people that just entered, bought themselves a vest and all of a sudden were like honored because they were older. And it's like, you don't know anything. Um, I, I do have a lot of hope and respect and love for the younger people coming in um, the, the future. And, you know, they're not doing things always the way we did them. And that's okay. Um, I, 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 I really kind of like that. You know, I, I, I like, I love the gender fluidity. Yeah. I love the, the openness to, different types of sexuality. I, it, it's just, it, it, it's something that I didn't see as much, you know, when I was younger and in the scene, you know, it, it was, it was, um, it's a lot more of anything goes now. And I'm very happy about that. But speaking of being young in the scene, in, in your journey, was there anything you wish you had done differently? Yeah, I wish I started younger. That, you know, I was like, wow, I wish I found this earlier. <laughs> yeah, I agree with you on that. Yeah. Yeah. You've talked a lot about LSM, Lesbian Sex Mafia, so far during the interview here today. But what is it? Tell us about it. Okay, so lesbian sex mafia is not lesbian, and it's not the mafia, okay? So it's always been open to all women that are into BDSM with other women. You know, it's always had a lot of bisexuals. You know, in 93, we added transsexual women, um, and then later on, we added... Um, and anybody that was trans that felt they were part of the women's community. It's really hard to do the words here because there's so much, um, you know, people transition and you don't, you know, it, it, it's very difficult to, to draw a line with, yeah. with, with our women's community. Yeah. Um, and uh, I, I think, mm, I think one of my biggest, things that I did at LSM, you know, I always have a platform when I start and LSM, when I, when I, when I got onto the board and I became chair after a few years, my big thing was that our meetings were members only oh. and our parties were open. Oh. 
And I thought that was kind of ass backwards because the meetings had all the education and I wanted that to be open. And the parties, I thought, I mean, you know, it's like, I want to have educated people at my parties. So um, I got that changed. Um, And now the parties are still open, but um, also our educational meetings are now open too. Um, So that was a big thing. Um, Also, I was on the board when we had the LSM 20 celebration. And um, that was an amazing celebration. It was in October, 2001, right after the Twin Towers came down. Oh. Yeah, right after 9-11. So we, we lost uh, some of our people that were gonna show. Um, we recently had the 40th anniversary, which we got hit by COVID. We're, we're so unlucky with oh. our anniversaries. Um, but oh. um, I, I was, I put together with, with that, with the board, I was, I'm no longer on the board, but I was, um, I put together a whole show um, for LSM that was on Zoom, all live performances, oh. some of them BDSM performances, some burlesque performances, um, all different kinds of things with a orgasm contest. Ah, I love it. <laughs> And, uh, you know, a bunch of a bunch of different things happening. And uh, we had about 100 people attend and um, we had an anniversary pin because I said we have to have merch, mm. um, you know, and I I don't know what we're going to do. Um, you know, we, we originally were going to have a big celebration. So um, I love LSM. Um, it's a it's a great organization. It is the oldest BDSM women's organization in the country. Wow. Yeah. Maybe you can do a 45th celebration. Yeah, we'll see. <laughs> maybe, maybe with the, you know, with the year there, it, it won't be quite as dramatic. <laughs> you are a writer. Tell us what you write. Tell us about that. Okay. So uh, my big achievement was I used to do a weekly newsletter online. And it had um, it had a couple of thousand subscribers. Um, I, I lost that list. Oh. <laughs> I don't have the anyway. Anyway, every week it would come out on a, on Monday, usually Monday, sometimes Tuesday, because I'd be late because you know life got in the way. Um, and it would have news, BDSM news. Um, some of it, um, Dave Rhodes would put into the Leather Journal, so I was a contributor to Leather Journal through that um and it would have what i did over the weekend whether it was go to an event you know and i would talk about different events that i went to uh because i was i did a lot of traveling um and um it would talk about upcoming events and it would talk about politics it had links in it um this is before there were a lot of pictures okay because um there weren't really pictures in it. It was, it was very text-based. Oh, okay. um, and that was called Lolita's P and P also known as Lolita's predictions and predilections. I, think <laughs> I the, love it. I think the leather archives has copies of it. Um, Cause Tony said it was a really important piece of, uh, uh, and Joseph both said that it was important uh, documentation of the BDSM leather community. Um, I also did a couple of books together with Joseph Bean as editor. Um, There were videos with book and they're out of print. One was uh, spanking and the other one was CBT in a nutshell. Oh, wow. Um, Yeah. Yeah. Um, So I I, I did those. Um, Unfortunately, they're out of print. Um, I also did a video that called the details of flogging. There were four flogging masters and I was one of them. Um, and, um, I, I, I'm kind of proud of that, that, that turned out really good. Um, I also wrote things for Prometheus over the years, which was the Euland Spiegel, um, magazine newsletter. And I, wrote for on our backs a bunch of times um 
which is a, a women's BDSM magazine. Okay. Back when they had magazines. Yes. No magazines anymore. Um, and I wrote chapter two for Tristan Taramino's Ultimate Guide to Kink, which is on caning, no, spanking, caning, and flogging. So oh, that's um, a good one. It's okay. Yeah. Yeah. And that that I've, that's still in print and you should buy that. Okay. Because I, I don't get money when you buy it, but um, it's a really good um, BDSM book with a lot of amazing authors in it. You know, you could look at that author list and start interviewing all the people that added that added chapters in there. Wow. And you might have, I think you, or didn't you, uh, I saw you on Instagram with Edge. Yeah. Edge is in that book too. Oh, okay. Okay. Yeah. So there's a lot of, a lot of important people in that book. What's the biggest misconception about you? Um, I think people sometimes are intimidated by me. Um, I once went, to, I went to an event a little while ago and the person that was at registration was just like really nasty to me. And I was like, I was on my best behavior. You know, I had my driver's license and I had my registration. I, had, I, I was doing everything right. Cause you know, I'm not, I'm not one of those people. I don't need the stinking badge, you know? Um, and they were nasty to me and I called them on it and I said, why, why are you being nasty to me? Well, cause I just figured that you, you know, they looked at me and they were like, well, um, I just figured that you would be, you know, full of yourself. <laughs> and I was like, I was like, I, I, I haven't done anything or said anything like that and she said you're right i'm sorry um so you know that sometimes people think that people that are well known are full of themselves i guess i don't know that that's that's a misconception lolita wool what an amazing and educational interview this has been and thank you for joining Inside Leather History, a fireside chat. Thank you for including me. This was great.